Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm Sandy Alnock. I'm an artist and today I'm just going to give you a heads up. This is going to be a long one. I wanted to do this deep dive into colored pencil papers, mostly for my own benefit, but I wanted to do more than just, hey, let's swatch out these techniques and see how they play out on each paper. I wanted to actually make a full drawing with each one to really put them through their paces. And in addition to showing you the finished drawings, I'm not going to show you more than little clips of producing them, but I'm also going to draw some small samples. So we're going to do some lollipops and I'll show you how each of the things that I'm talking about play out on each of these four papers. All right, so buckle in, get a cup of coffee if you need to, hit the pause button, I'll be waiting here and then we'll get started. So let's start by introducing the papers themselves and the big drawings that I did for each one of them. I'm going to start with the least expensive and move my way up. First is Strathmore Bristol. I just know a lot of people who do stuff on Strathmore Bristol using it for crafting, that kind of thing. And it works fine. It just requires a little more TLC. It requires a few more layers to get something going. Like on this bird, it was incredibly difficult to get anything feeling like it was really contrasting. And that mid-tone all over the belly that was really ridiculously hard to get it to happen. I had to use a lot of blending solution and layer after layer. It finally did work, but it was a lot of work to do on an inexpensive paper that's approximately 50 cents a sheet when you get a nine by 12 pad of it. So that's an option for sure. Then there are some illustrators that I know that use Daler Rowney Heavyweight. And, and I bought this because I thought I wanted to try it and see if there's something magical about it. The people that use it, I found, have a very specific kind of style using a lot of layers and a lot of fine detail. And I don't work quite that way. I don't take that kind of time, but if you have that kind of time to spend, then this is a really great paper. It's very smooth and it does take a lot of layers again to build up. This one, I didn't use any blending solution. I just used layers and layers and layers and more layers and more layers, but I used all complementary colors to build up those layers and create the dimension. It was a lot of fun to do. It's really cute little birdies with their fat bellies, but it was not simple to do. It was not easy. And if you have trouble with your hand getting tired, that might be something you want to take into account. Now there was this other drawing that I did and I kind of wrecked it and then I'm trying to pull back from it, but I wanted to see on this same Daler Rowney paper, what would happen if I just put a lot of color in the background. And you know, on the other one, I just use a light touch with it. But for this one, I took a cotton ball and some blending solution and I covered the whole background of it after I had scribbled color all over it. And then I went over top of the owl and softened that because it was just gonna take too long for the kind of detail that I wanted to get. So I am not finished with this one yet. I might finish it soon in another video, so stay tuned. But the one thing I discovered here was this paper, once it had been treated with the blending solution, I could actually go back in once it was all dried and start drawing over top of some of that dark. It doesn't become real white white, but it does actually work a little bit. So on any paper you use, try using the white after everything is all settled and dried from the blending solutions. That brings us to one of my favorites, which is Stonehenge. And I discovered this a number of years ago. You can search my channel for Stonehenge and you'll find lots and lots of projects done on this paper. Comes in pads and sketchbooks and all sorts of things. About $1.50 a sheet for the 9x12. And I'm doing all 9x12s just so these are relatively apples to apples. And this is the sample bird drawing that I did. I did this in all complementary colors, all those Browns and grays are made with compliments in addition to the oranges around the bird's face. And a lot of the 
detail that you see in here is done with negative drawing because when you use a white pencil on a lot of papers, on all kinds of stuff, you're trying to put those fine details on the top, it just doesn't come out as white white. And I don't really want white white, I just want something whiter than that. So what I ended up doing was using light color down first and then adding in using negative drawing the dark areas in between. But I loved how this one came out. I love all the fluffy feathers. So cute. And then we're going to look at pastel mat, which is pricey. As you can see on the screen, it's like almost $4 a sheet when you buy a 12 sheet pad. So yeah, pricey. But you can buy a single sheet if you just want to try it out for about five bucks for a sheet, a little over five bucks. So the pastel mat is just wonderful stuff. I did that, that main part of the wing in the center there in Indian Thrine Blue. And then I did white over top of it so I could put all the little parts of the feathers in there because the feathers go every which way as they interlock. It's just kind of amazing what contour feathers look like. Uh, this paper comes on a backing of some kind. I don't know what that is made of. I don't know what the paper is made of. It's just a unique surface for drawing. And I've used it with pastel, but this is kind of my first foray into trying colored pencil with it. And it's just been a lot of fun to explore what I can do with it. Now, in my previous video, I showed you this drawing that was done on a charcoal gray paper. It's kind of a bluish gray, like slate gray. And as you can see, you do get some warping of the paper, but it's really easy to mount back down if you want to frame it and all that sort of thing. So it's not a big deal. And I tape my paper down while I'm working on it anyway. So don't think that it's there's something wrong if it warps. But I had a lot of fun creating this bokeh background and layering all the colors and using all different kinds of blending methods, dry blending with it. And then all of that white was done in pencil and it's all put on top of the drawing with pencil. So that's one of the things that pastel matte can do. And here, all of this white on this charcoal gray drawing, all that white is drawn pencil. It's not, there's no gouache, there's no nothing. It's all white. And then all the colors in here are again complementary colors and both of these drawings both of these birds the blue tit and the nuthatch are new classes and i'll talk about those at the end of this video all right now let's get to the test with the lollipops i am not one to just make little squares i've seen countless little charts with squares and they don't tell me anything so i'm doing lollipops so i have something consistent across all four that i'm going to draw each phase for and just see where any differences come in and immediately the stonehenge and the pastel mat were darker i just got more pigment and using the same pressure i got more pigment off the pencil ignore those prices by the way on the stonehenge and the pastel mat those are not correct but then I decided to try just a real quick dry blending before anything else happens to the color. And all the papers did a little bit of movement of the pigment, especially when it's lightly pressed onto the paper. If it's really pressed in hard, it can be difficult to move, but all four of them were fine, except the pastel mat, which ate up my Q-tip. It also ate up a uh, cotton ball on another project. So uh, it does not like having anything kind of cottony and floofy running across it. Okay, second layer of color. I went in with slightly heavier pressure just to kind of get the feel for how each paper compared. Because even though I did all those drawings of birds, I did them across, you know, a couple of weeks. So I didn't have an apples to apples. I knew which ones felt better when I was drawing them. And as always, because you know, this is how the world works, the nicer papers that cost more money were a much more pleasant drawing experience. Because for me, the experience of actually making the drawing is important, because if it doesn't feel good, I'm not going to want to do it again. So when things are difficult, like with the uh, the Bristol paper and the Dale Rowney, they're just harder to do. You can get a really good effect with them. It's just a lot more work to do it. And since I am like always running around like a chicken with my head cut off, I kind of like it when my supplies help me to get to the stage that I want to get to. Now here you can notice immediately that the Stonehenge is getting much darker. 
very, very quickly. And it's also more red, so it picks up color and, and I don't know whether it's changing the color or it's just the fact that there is more of the color on the paper because of the texture of it. It's not so smooth, so a bumpy paper pulls more pigment off of the pencil. Same with the pastel mat. So now we're gonna test some blending solution. And I'm just gonna do a real light, quick thing just to see how the blending goes. And you can use a brush, you can use a blending stomp, you can use all different kinds of things. I'm just gonna use another Q-tip because they were handy. And each one, I'll be able to tell whether or not the color is the same or whether it is darker on one than another. Now the sameness or whatever might be due to the paper itself. It might be due to the amount of pigment that got left on the paper. So when there's more pigment on the paper, like on this one, like it just immediately gets even darker. It doesn't mean you're gonna get bad results from the cheaper papers. It just means you get a different result and each one of them is, is different. Now this is where the, the lovely pastel mat just kept eating my poor little, <laughs> my poor little Q-tip did not like that at all. So with pastel mat, you might want to use something like a brush in order to do that because it just like eats up the poor cotton. So now I'm going to apply color over top of the solution. And with every paper that I've ever used a blending solution on, especially if the blending solution is still a little bit damp, you get much richer color. So I'm using a slightly different color, a slightly darker color, but I'm pressing not even as hard as I did in the last round that I put down of a layer of color, and I'm immediately getting richer color. So coloring over top of that under underpainting of that first layer that had blending solution applied, you're going to have an easier time putting the next layer on and it's going to grab, I don't know how it grabs more pigment off the pencil. I'm not sure what it's doing. There's probably some science thing that I don't understand, but I know what it does, even if I don't know why it does it. And I can start to create some really stronger dimension in it because I'm putting down color over top of all that blending solution. And the, as I went through each phase of this, it was surprising to me how much more color I could get onto the Stonehenge than on the other, these other two papers and how much easier even it got to be on the pastel mat. It was just like this progression across all of them that made a huge difference in the experience of drawing as well as in the results because I can get a really strong contrasting result. You know me and contrast, I love contrast because that's what makes things look dimensional. But each, each one, as you get into a more expensive paper, gets easier to work with and it gives you better result. Now, all of life is that way. When we pay more for something, we get more for it in, in most cases, I won't say all cases. So even if it, it hurts, like thinking, man, I don't want to buy the nicer pencils or the nicer paper or the nicer paints or brushes or whatever. It is amazing when you get to that point, how much more you can actually do with a high quality supply. So now I'm going to add a darker layer. The lollipops that I bought, because I had to buy lollipops, right? In order to do a video with lollipops in it. And the lollipops that I had, this red one had a streak of small detail running through it that was really gonna define this as a realistic lollipop. They might already look dimensional, but wait until you see this added in because there was these, I don't know, like veins of something, veins of, of highlight shadow and all that running through the interior of the lollipop. And it was kind of fun twisting it in the light and trying to figure out what I was going to capture in my lollipops. And some of it I used very light pressure in some areas to let it fade out. Other areas made them nice and sharp to add some streaks and that sort of thing in it, it starts to give it a little bit more life. Now there's a lot of contrast now between this dark purplish color and the lighter orangey red color, but we'll be dealing with that as we go. Cause I really wanted to put 
all of these through their paces with many layers of color to see like, is there a point where one of them blows up and just won't do anymore? Or will they all continue to get better and better? And this, this portion of it was like really fun to just make all these little lines. I couldn't make them exactly the same, of course, but I was trying for as much apples to apples as I could to get this to look realistic. And uh, using a dark purplish color is what I saw in the lollipop rather than just using something that was a pure red because there's not a lot of pure reds that are going to be that dark. So I aimed a little bit more toward a purplish, which gave me a lot more contrast. And you can see the contrast again is pumped up more in the Stonehenge than it was in the first two. And the first two look great until you see them next to the Stonehenge. So it's not that you, you know, you have to use the Stonehenge or the pastel mat, but the visual difference is kind of astonishing when you see them all together. And I'm using the same pressure of the pencil across each one. And by the way, that little piece of paper under my hand is under my hand to keep the oils from my hand from getting on the paper, which can sometimes make the paper reject pigment in those areas but it also keeps my hand from pressing on the pigment and dragging the pigment across the page because you can just smoosh it with your hand. And if you use a glassine paper or at least a, a really nice soft, slick kind of maybe tracing paper or vellum or something, that will protect your paper quite a bit. But I mean, look at the difference here. Look at that. The contrast is off the charts on the pastel mat. And remember, I'm not going to have to really do much to get that to be any stronger than it is. But I'm going to go one more layer and enrich the color on these lollipops because they're feeling kind of orange along with that dark purple. And I wanted them to feel more red. So what happens if I start putting in more red so that I push that color even darker to make it a deeper, deeper, deeper type of lollipop? And I'm also going to close up some of the highlight areas because I want to test these and see how they do eventually with white. So I'm going to cover them up and I was kind of fussing around with how much I wanted to cover them up. Did I want to make them all solid red so that the white would be forced <laughs> to be the highlight? But I also, since I was going to use these for cards, I didn't want to wreck them all and make them incapable of having any white highlights. So I was having a little debate with myself about whether I was going to do this just for the test or whether I wanted to keep them usable for what I had planned for my little lollipops. Uh, you might uh, leave comments in the doobly-doo if you have good sentiments that I could use for lollipop cards. They're mostly going to be probably thank you cards that I'll send to patrons. So if there's any thank you slash lollipop sentiments that you can think of, let me know. So with each of these, as I'm adding that darker color, it's kind of making the dark color into a mid-tone because I'm darkening the lighter color into a mid-tone. So it's kind of balancing out and flattening the lollipop just a bit. And with the Stonehenge one, like the dark purple almost has disappeared now. But as I'm working through with the pastel matte, it's not killing off any of that darkness. It's leaving it there. So that's going to be one less layer that I'm going to need to put back into that particular lollipop. So here's where I started covering up those highlights because I thought I'm, I'm going to have to test it. I want to see if I put a lot more of that red into each of those highlight areas and cover up some of that. Am I going to be able to bring that those white highlights back out so I decided I was going to just go for it and cover them up and make the white do the work and see if that would that would suffice and going over them with that darker color that darker mid-tone that I had just used instead of the lighter one I just wanted to push it I could have done the lighter red and not had the white have to work so hard but you know 
I'm, I'm not for letting my colors off lightly, so I'm going to make them do their job. So next up is blending solution again, you know, just testing another layer of that. What does that do for it? Because it's going to start really pulling together some of the, uh, the purplish color and that middle red color. And then as I got to the highlight section in each one, I flipped over the Q-tip so that I was doing dry blending over most of those highlight areas. I just didn't want to make the white pencil have to work quite that hard. <laughs> so I tried making it so that it at least wasn't going to be wet because white doesn't seem to like to go over wet very much. But in the bird drawings that I did, I just know how much I tried to put white in over top of things for those small, little tiny feathers, little tiny edges of things. And it was just very difficult on the cheaper papers. And it got easier on the Stonehenge and it got even easier still on the pastel mat. But just covering all that up at least gives me a good basis to see what is white going to actually do. And you'll be able to see for yourself, I can press as hard as I want on these and I, just barely anything is going to happen. It's going to be like a, just a little bit of pink and not be super sharp and bright. Now you can add some white with white gouache or white gel pen that will generally suck up any red color underneath of it and it will turn into pink highlights there is something called oh gosh it's from pencil and brush it's a powder that you mix into a titanium white and I haven't had a lot of success with it but whatever but the pastel matte I could go in and put in some white and then go back in you know 10 minutes later and go put in more white and then stop again and then go back, put in more white and go work on a different area, come back and put in more white. I could keep adding more and I could add really fine details in it. Whereas when the others got all built up with colored pencil, I couldn't get any sharp detail on any of it anymore. It was just a lost cause as you get to a certain point in filling that paper. Now I wanted to see what it would take to bring all of these back to having some contrast again so that they would match better with the pastel mat. And so this is to say that it's not that you can't do good things with these cheaper papers. You just have to work harder at it and work more on it. You have to be more aware of your contrast and that sort of thing because you just have to do more to get the paper to accept enough pencil. And there does come a point when you're using heavy pressure and blending solution like I'm using here that it's just going to become all waxy and weird and if you're using Prismacolors you'll end up with bloom happening and stuff but here's me going in and adding more white just because I knew I could. Now if you know you're going to have something that's going to be a bright white put the white down first especially if you're working on like a dark paper because what I did here with the glowing orb in the sky as well as the white in the splash. The main part of that white was white at the beginning and then I added some of the dots on top of color but the white remained that white because I put the white down first so it wasn't fighting with color underneath of it. So now for those two new courses, the Nuthatch and the Blue Tip. This is the Nuthatch and You'll learn in the class how to layer your colors so that you're going to be able to create all these beautiful feathers. I'm going to tell you all about what those feathers are. I learned that some feathers are called contour feathers and some are the flight feathers and some are the down feathers. So they're broken up into lessons about each of the feathers. And I am going to be adding some more content to it in this coming week because it may or may not be ready by the time this goes live, but I'm going to try adding more on just those specific feather shapes. So this is then the blue tit, who it, it actually in the photographic reference is not blue on the back, even though that bird has more blue on it. It's just the yellow tummy that I wanted to draw. So that's why we're doing a blue tit, but I use purple because we're focusing in both of these classes on using complementary colors to create shading. So purple with the yellow, on this dark background made this bird just really beautiful. And that post 
is all purple and yellow with a little bit of white in it. So both of those classes are currently available. Links in the doobly-doo to that. And yeah, maybe I'll finish that owl in my next video. Would you like to see that? Let me know in a comment and uh, I will see you on Saturday with another video. Take care. Thank you so much. I'll talk to you later. Bye.